This is a quick introduction to the Baroque 17th century art in Europe. It does begin in Italy, and it comes out of success that emerged from the Counter-Reformation. Okay, the Counter-Reformation, you all remember, is the church's response to the Protestant Reformation begun by Martin Luther in the early 16th century. By the middle of the 16th century, the church decides it's time to fight back, to try and bring back some of those lost souls. The church decides to use art as a tool in that battle, but it does set down some rules. Among the rules, it says that art needs to be accurate, so it has to tell the story with truth, it has to tell the story clearly, and for our purposes, it needs to have decorum, or I'm going to say respectability. So, folks, no more nudes, for example. In addition, and probably most importantly, it has to be inspirational. It has to touch the emotions of the viewer to make the viewer feel something. The style in Italy, where it begins, will be coming out of this, highly naturalistic, very lifelike and convincing, filled with drama and energy. It takes place in an instant in time, in a snap of your fingers. It's often theatrical, and it involves the viewer directly. Consequently, the works of art are going to be open, very open compositions to pull you in. An open composition means that the work of art essentially invites you to become part of it. Italian Baroque art tends also to be optimistic, and that is the sense that the church has been successful because of its counter-reformation activities. The art also tends to support the beliefs of the church, and you have a really good Smart History video giving you an example of that. It's Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa. It would be possible to refer to this art as propagandistic or simply as supporting the beliefs of the church in this particular moment in history. One of the things we're going to say also is that the art will continue to reference the ancient world. And that will also include not just the Greeks and Romans, but it will also include biblical sources. The master player of the Baroque is Bernini, who dominated the landscape in Rome and in Italy in general in the 17th century. This is his self-portrait on the left. Uh, Bernini was not, not just a sculptor, although that's what we know him best for, and his works decorate the city of Rome when you visit today. Uh, this is one of Bernini's fountain designs on the right. He was blessed with all kinds of skills in carving, but he also was a playwright, and that served him well because it allowed him to instill his sculpture with a sense of vitality, openness, and drama. One of the classic comparisons, for example, would be Bernini's statue of David facing Goliath on the right as opposed to Michelangelo's high renaissance piece of David as he awaits the appearance of Goliath on the left. The differences include the fact that Bernini's version is in action as this figure moves through space. He moves also along a diagonal, breaking through an imaginary picture plane between you, the viewer, and the piece of sculpture. If you look closely, you're also going to see that the figure of David, while not exactly clothed, is displaying decorum. So it has appropriateness in terms, respectability, in terms of the world of art. Bernini's David is also life-sized, unlike Michelangelo's very large-scale carving of David. And the reason for that is Bernini wants us to be able to relate to it. The work of art originally also was placed just on a small plinth, that's this right here, directly on ground level.
Bernini plays a little game with us, too. The feet, the toes of David actually curl over the plinth as if he is acting in our space. This originally was placed on the ground, and as we approached the piece of sculpture, it put us directly inside the battle between David and Goliath, as David is about to sling his stone at Goliath. Uh, this is the area where it's displayed today, and even now you can come in the doorway and you can confront the statue of David and Goliath and maybe get a little bit of the sense of the drama that Bernini put into this carving. This is Bernini's Apollo and Daphne, also done when he was a very young man in his 20s. It, too, shows an instant in time, this time not drawn from the Bible, but drawn from antique literature. The story of Apollo the sun god, a god who became enamored with uh, the daughter of a river god. Her name was Daphne. She did not re return his affection, and the god Apollo became driven to chase her. This is an instant in time when Daphne calls out to her father, the river god, for protection from the advances of the god Apollo. Apollo is just about to touch her, just about to grab her, and we have to assume to ravish her. Daphne is saved by her father, who, in an instant, and this is instantaneous, in an instant, has her turned into a laurel tree. And of course, folks, you can't have sex with a laurel tree. So it is a way of preserving her chastity and saving her. This is the instant of transformation. And Bernini has maximized the impact of this by giving us a variety of textures. Uh, the bark that, and remember the word decorum here, comes around the front of the body of uh, Daphne and also the drapery that swirls around Apollo. But I'd like you to particularly see some of Bernini's details because he is a master carver in marble. There's no one who ever lived who can touch this guy. Uh, these are the toes of Daphne as they're beginning to sprout roots. Look at the vegetation, which seems rough in comparison to the very smooth surface of the marble. This is an upward glance as these figures swirl, following a diagonal in movement. And this is more detail of the hair of Daphne flying out. And take a look at the hair and all of these delicately carved, this is marble, a very fragile material, all of these delicately carved uh, depictions of laurel leaves sprouting from the fingers of Daphne. Right here, you can see a comparison between Renaissance and Baroque. On the left, this is Daphne, a silent scream emitting from her mouth in that instant of transformation. It is dramatic, momentary, and instantaneous. On the right, a detail from Michelangelo's Pietà, which is poetic and eternal. Baroque painting in Italy was fundamentally changed in the 17th century by a young artist whose name is Caravaggio. Caravaggio, and you can see a self-portrait on the right, I really do think was the bad boy of the Baroque. He gained for himself an incredible reputation as a painter, but also a very striking police record, which he acquired as a very young man, ultimately having to flee the city of Rome after committing murder. So in his paintings, you're going to expect some additional emotional charging, and that's going to be true here for his, um, I'm going to say 1610 painting of David with the head of Goliath. The moment that Caravaggio has selected in this story is not David watching and waiting like Michelangelo gave us, or David in action with his sling, which Bernini gave us. Instead, it is the moment after Goliath has been killed and his head has been cut off. The blood still drips from the head right here. And if you look carefully, you're going to see one eye is a little bit more open than the other. So it's that instant when Goliath is actually dying. This is an open composition. It's instantaneous, it's powerful, and it is dramatic. 
David holds the head of Goliath into the space of the viewer, literally engaging the viewer. Now, the most powerful part of this, however, is probably knowledge that the face of Goliath is actually the face of Caravaggio. A closer look at the uh, two individuals will give you, I think, a reality check that this is uh, a personal painting and it is filled with psychological drama as well as biblical history. Caravaggio's style is going to be influential inside Italy and in other countries too because he introduces relatively down-to-earth figures in his paintings that are easy to relate to. He also gives us great drama with strong contrasts of light versus dark. His figures are placed against a dark background close to the surface of the picture plane and they take place in an instant in time. Caravaggio will be one of the influences on the great Flemish master in what we would call basically Belgium today, who was a superstar, a real superstar, and his name is Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, these are portraits of Rubens along with images of his house. Rubens goes to study in Italy. That was the center of the art world in the 17th century, and he literally behaves like a vacuum cleaner, sucking up influences from everyone. This shows up in his famous Prometheus Bound in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. In this large and very Baroque painting, Rubin depicts Prometheus, and this is another ancient subject matter from Greek and Roman mythology. Prometheus steals fire from the gods to give to humans, and as a penalty for that, he is chained to a rock, and daily a large eagle, that's what we're looking at right here, comes to eat his liver. Magically, the liver regrows, and poor Prometheus is bound, literally, to day after day after day go through this torture. This is very Baroque in its instantaneous quality and its drama. It also shows us that Rubens has borrowed heavily from the artists he studied in Italy, one of them in is including Caravaggio. Uh, the figure is very close to the surface of the picture plane. He is going along a Baroque diagonal, and that's a common compositional device. We've already seen it with Bernini. It tends to throw off the symmetry, make the work of art more convincing in terms of its movement, and here it's almost as if Prometheus is hurling into the space of the viewer. So we have the influence of the Baroque in Italy, a diagonal. We also have the figure close to the surface of the picture plane. I'd like you to be thinking Caravaggio. And it is spotlighted against a darkened background. I'd also like you to be thinking Caravaggio. Okay, in addition to that, the figure... <coughs> The figure is muscular, strong, and ideal. So we can use the expression ideal naturalism here. And that is going to refer to Michelangelo as a source and also to the ancient sculpture that Rubens was able to study while he was in Italy. The North, however, has its own character, and for many decades it produced highly detailed works of art. Rubens continues that Northern tradition, even though he's imported Baroque back home when he leaves Italy, up in the foliage. Look at all of the details up here in the tree, and all of the storytelling with a chain and an image symbolically referencing the theft of fire. So this large painting is a blending of many sources. Uh, the sky in the background, this great blue patch back here, also comes from Venice, which Rubens studied while he was staying in Italy and behaving, as I said, like a vacuum cleaner. Rubens was immensely successful when he went home, introducing this new amazing style with great force and power. He was so successful that he really had to create a workshop, which he oversaw very well. And often his paintings were partly painted by him and partly painted by other artists. That's true here. Rubens asked for the assistance of 
a painter who specialized in birds and animals. His name was Franz Snyders, and he did this magnificent eagle. Rubens reduced the cost of this painting for the man he was selling it to because he hadn't painted it all by his own hand. This gives us a little view into the way workshops functioned in the period of the 17th century by certainly one of the greatest of the 17th century masters.